All right, how's that? Can you hear me? We'll go ahead and get started. Quick poll. How many people, first time coming to a DFW Data Viz event? Fantastic. How'd you hear about us? Meetup. Meet Meetup, like, suggested us to you? Mm -hmm. That's great. You're like, I need an email? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you. I was in email. Okay, good. Anybody else? Yeah. You, you threw him. <laughs> here. How many people came from DFW Data Science Meetup? Anybody, Anybody here is also a member of Data Science, Big Data? Tech Titans, couple. Okay, so like I said earlier, if you want to get on the Wi-Fi SMU guest, um, give it you connect to the Wi-Fi, give it your cell phone number, it will text you a password to then you can log in if you want Wi-Fi. Um, if you're not already a member of the group and haven't joined, this bit.ly link will get you to our group so that you can join, become a member, and you'll get emails when we schedule new speakers. Um, I try to schedule one speaker a month. Um, all of our events are free. We try to find local speakers because we want to keep it free. Um, but when we can, we'll fly in a speaker, depending on what kind of funds we have and whose schedule is available. If you know of anybody who's coming to town that would be a good speaker, let me know. That would be fantastic. We've caught a couple people while they were in town for work or for a conference and had them come out and give a talk as well. Um, quick about me, if you don't know me, my name is Randy Crum. Um, my company is called InfoNoot. We design data viz for companies all over the world, whether it's online infographics for marketing content uh, or internal communications, board meeting presentations, sales presentations, a whole bunch of internal communications we do as well. I run the website, coolinfographics.com. Uh, this year was its 10 year anniversary. Um, conveniently, my book is called Cool Infographics, so it's really easy to find. Um, run the group and I do teach a class we'll talk about in a second. Um, here at SMU on data viz, infographics, and dashboard design. Um, if you want to tweet, that's fine. You want to take pictures, that's fine. Um, people love to see photos of our events, so if you want to even post them on Meetup or on Twitter, um, I'll grab them and put them in the event. Um, but you can find me on Twitter at RT Crum. That's where I post a lot of news articles and stuff going on in the data viz community. Uh, so tonight, our sponsors, like our, my company, we just sort of put this together. Um, SMU gives us free space. Um, which is fabulous because I know a lot of meetups have to have to rent their space at co-working locations or even worst case like a hotel ballroom or something like that. Um, so we bounce back and forth between the Plano campus and the Dallas campus just to try and catch people because a lot of people in Dallas don't want to drive up here and a lot of people up in Plano don't want to drive down into Dallas. I'm out in the mid cities. It's the same for me going either way. It doesn't really matter. Um, tonight we have a special sponsor. IBM Cloud has provided food. So everybody give Daryl a big round of applause. Yes. Uh, you want to say a few words about IBM Cloud? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Jerome Pyle. I'm here locally. I work out of the Pell office. Well, technically, work out of my home Pell office and my home base. And that. Uh, my team specializes in where the channel team for IBM Cloud covered analytics, cognitive, and uh, cloud itself. So if you have any questions, something, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, muscle on Analytics DS, my Twitter handle on the hand LinkedIn handle. So feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank you. And thank you again for all the food. <laughs> so please eat up. <laughs> um, and we'll send out an email to the members so that if you want to get a hold of him, you'll have a way to get uh, a hold of him through, for IBM. If you want to take a shot of that, that's great. Okay. Um, SMU is starting a new digital analytics and insight certificate program. Anybody familiar with that already? Um, it's picking up in January. Um, and they gave us a discount code. This is our discount code for basically anything you want to do through SMU. Um, VIP Instructor 10 will get you 10% off whatever you register for. Um, but this is going to start in January. It's going to be the first time they run that as a certificate program. Are you teaching that? I am teaching an elective course for it. So thank you for the transition. Right? <laughs> so here's my class. <laughs> so my class is going to run April, May. Um, it's an elective choice as part of the certificate program. Um, it's six weeks, one night a week, and it's three hours each night. Um, so we do 18 hours of class. You can do a lot of um, what we talk about tonight is what we're going to actually do hands-on in the class. And so everybody brings a laptop, um, and we do hands-on exercises with sample data sets, whether it's an application uh, or a website to visualize data. We do a bunch of stuff that way. 
Um, same discount code. This will get you 10% off um, any of the codes. If you want to get to my class, um, here's a short bit.ly link. The SMU URLs are big, long, and ugly. So bit.ly uh, SMU DV Spring 18 will get you straight to uh, my class page. Did you do, uh, that design as well for the Sorry, what? That design for the dashboard as well? Like, is that a separate class? I'm trying to understand it. Like, yeah, so of the six weeks, um, one night and half of a second night is just dedicated to dashboards. What, what do you use for that? Uh, we'll use Tableau, we'll use Microsoft Power BI, and then we'll just talk about concepts of no matter what tool you do, what's good dashboard design. You said this was a certificate course? Or this is an elective for their certificate course. A certificate course actually is multiple courses. Can we just take this course? Or? Yeah, you can just take this one off and have nothing to do with their certificate program. You just want to take this course. That's how most people do it. Is just take it as an off, one off, you know, six week course. Question? Is it question? here or down there? That's a good question because we bounce back and forth. I forget which one where they've scheduled this one. The last one we ran was in Dallas, but the continuing and professional ed building, if you're not familiar with it, is actually across the highway from the main campus, so it's easy parking like here. You don't have to worry about a parking pass and getting on campus and stuff like that. So it's right near Mockingbird Station. Awesome. Okay, any other questions? Um, sponsors, we're always looking for sponsors. Like I said, we're a free group. Um, we look for corporate sponsors like IBM, thank you, to either bring in food or give us funds like uh, last month. Anybody see Alberto Cairo last month? Uh, a couple people, fantastic speaker. We flew in from the University of Miami. Um, the SMU MSDS program helped fund us to fly him out here. So anytime we can do that, I do have a sheet. Um, if you want to take it to your company, to your boss, and sort of show what they can get if they become a sponsor, these are my ideas, but we can always come up with something new too. Um, employment. I always like to stop because this is a community of you guys. Does anybody want to announce either your company has an open position and talk about that, or you're actually looking for a role um, and want to see, you know, tell the group and see if there's anybody here that's interested? So the floor is open to you guys. If there are any open roles or anybody looking for a position, everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Then we'll keep going. Um, a number of the past events, you know I'm trying to film these. I've probably got eight or ten of them that I've put up on YouTube. Um, and so this bit.ly link, bit.ly DFW data viz video, um, will get you the videos of the past events you've missed. Um, it's just me with a standalone camera. This is not professionally edited video. Um, but you get to see some of these great speakers that we've had in. Um, Cole's the author. She's out in California. Eric's a fantastic speaker that works up in... Um, where does he work now? Up in Keller, I think. Um, Dallas Morning News, that kind of stuff. So it takes me a while. I think I've got four or five videos from the last six months that I haven't put up yet. So they'll get there eventually. Um, but that's just you know me getting it done. Upcoming events. I already know what our next event's going to be. Um, so January 18th is going to be our next event. Uh, Jainan from UTD and Sogeti is going to come and talk about visualizing data in heads-up displays. Um, he's got a fantastic talk. He's done this to the Big Design Conference before. Anybody been to the Big Design Conference before? Um, but fantastic speaker, and we're going to have a good turnout. I haven't really figured out. I posted it that it's going to be in Plano. I really don't know if it's going to be in Plano or Dallas yet. It depends on SMU and where they put us. Um, but I had to put something in there just to get the event up. Um, so it's up, and you can go ahead and RSVP for it already. Um, anybody else know of any other data science, data analytics, data viz, like events coming up in, say, the next 30 to 60 days you want to share? Vish, anybody else? Upcoming conferences, anything in town, workshops, nothing. Everybody's going to be home for the holidays. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm always looking for future topics and speakers. I'd love to hear from you, like, what you would like to see in the future. Even if you don't know who the speaker could be, I can work on it. Um, it might be presentation design. It might be dashboard design. It might be coding in R or D3. We've done those before. Um, anything in the world of data viz, um, sort of give me some feedback either in the comments on Meetup. You can send me a note through Meetup or grab one of my cards here and it's got my email address. Feel free to just send me a note and say, I'd love to see this or... Look, I'd like to talk about this, or I know somebody in my company that would be great talking about this. Um, it really helps to have you guys help us find uh, speakers and topics, because it's just kind of me doing it.
Okay, so tonight's talk, what is good data viz design? Um, we do have a hashtag, I'll mention this for, the, for our meetup group, just DFW data viz, all one word on Twitter. If you wanna share stuff, that's fine too. Okay, everybody ready? <clears throat> all the links, I have a lot of slides and I go fast. Um, all the links, including a link to all the slides, are at this one URL. So if you grab coolinfographics.com slash uh, dataviz dash December 2017, you can have links to all the examples that have an online link somewhere or a tool that's online somewhere. And at the very top of that page is a link to SlideShare where all these slides are available for you guys to view later. Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> um, but that way, we're going to go fast. You don't have to write a whole bunch of stuff down. It's all on that page if you want to grab it. OK, everybody get it? Almost? I can come back later. That's good. OK, so if we're going to talk about good data viz design, we actually have to break this apart. Um, so let's start with data viz just by itself to begin with. So you, as consumers of data and information, um, your job gets harder every single day. We love putting more and more stuff online. We hate deleting things. That's true in corporations as well. Welcome, come on in. Grab some food on your way in. <laughs> um, so your audience has the same problem. Um, they're struggling with how do I find what I'm actually looking for when that pile I'm digging through keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, whether it's research data or the internet or whatever. Um, so we're dying, we're drowning in this uh, sea of data, all of us as the end users, as the receivers of information. This is not what data viz design looks like, right? We're not talking about color theory. We're not talking about typography. Um, you can get to that at the end, but data viz is primarily a means of communicating an insight uh, or information or a finding from the data. Communicating that is more important than choosing the right color to make it your brand on brand colors and stuff like that. Um, we certainly get to that later because we like things that are visually appealing, um, but that's not really the focus of data viz design. So what is data viz? Um, and, and usually I have to make this distinction between what is data viz and what is an infographic and what is other forms of art that use data. So this is a chart, three major stock market indices or about 100,000 data points shown in this chart. Um, this is a data viz. Here you go. I have visualized the data. Have at it. Make some sense of it. Um, and it stands alone by itself. Infographics take data viz as a tool, combine them with illustrations and icons and text and a cohesive layout to tell a story. Right, so this one infographic has 26 different data visualizations in it to help tell that story. Um, and in fact, data viz is a skill that we all need to continue to develop and practice and everything else because we use it in infographics, we use it in reports, we use it in presentations, we use it in blog posts, we use it in articles, um, we use it in posters and sales brochures and, and everywhere else. So data viz, we actually use it as a skill in all of these different places. Um, this is a customer journey map um, where this could be a 10 step bullet point list um, but we visualize it as this path, this journey that these three people take for affiliate marketing and how affiliate marketing works. So you've got the affiliate, you've got the merchant, and then you've got Jack who's going to buy something off the website. Um, and by visualizing it in this path and make it more engaging for the users, um, this for Sugar Ray who posted this um, got easily 50 times her normal traffic for text blog posts. In fact, she started selling this as posters to raise money for charity on Zazzle because um, she really was doing well with these. Um, sales data, so we could size circles to match like here are our top retailer customers and um, display how much sales is going on within the company. Um, this is an agile process or business processes or product life cycles. We visualize those so it doesn't have to always be specifically numeric data. Um, sometimes it is a diagram of a business process uh, or you know, illustrations that we create from scratch to visualize either a concept or what the business idea or the business model is. Um, this is a competitive assessment. Um, so if you're going to take a new product to market, in this case, these are cordless impact drivers. Um, and it's just a snapshot of what's on the shelf today. So what are the brands? What are the even the shapes and outlines of their products? What are their price points? Their torque, their speed, their impacts per minute. Um, and so if you're going to launch a new product into this market, this is what you use as, okay, here's what's out there today. And here's why we think our product is going to be able to fit and compete within this market. 
Um, we do a lot of qualitative data. So anybody work with qualitative data? Unstructured data is what they like to call it today. Um, it's a lot of text-based data. Um, in this case, um, I use this example. These are Amazon reviews, right? And so this green word cloud are positive Amazon reviews. And this red word cloud are negative Amazon reviews. Um, we do a lot of visualizing qualitative data, which could be focus groups, could be journals that consumers um, have, interviews, um, but it's not statistically valid, right? So it's, it's interesting to product development, product managers, um, that gives them some ideas of where they need to go look further. Um, but we have to be careful not to visualize qualitative of data in a pie chart because you don't want to imply that it's statistically valid. We only talked to 10 focus groups. We didn't talk to thousands of people. Um, you can make that assumption that 80% of the market is going to believe this. And of course, quantitative data is very um, useful. We do a whole bunch in numeric data. This is consumer research data. Um, here we visualize 21 different survey questions on one page using these grids of 100 squares to show the percentages. Um, and this is pretty pleasing to the eye to scan left and right across a brand or even top to bottom. You can do those comparisons pretty easily within one consumer attribute compared to if this was 21 pie charts, it would just be horrible. You would just burn into your eyes. Um, when you visualize data, uh, it is important to understand that you are putting that data into context for your audience. If you don't, as the data viz designer, that audience is going to bring their own context and you have completely lost control of that story. Right? You have no idea. Every one of you is going to bring a different context to whatever number I show you. So if I show you that there are 3 billion global internet users and I put it in a really big font and put it on a projector so it's even bigger on this big screen, you still don't have any context. Right? Every one of you is comparing 3 billion to something you already know, and I have no idea what you're doing, and it's probably all different. But I have to tell designers all the time that big fonts are not data visualizations. Making the font big on the PowerPoint slide, making the font big on the sales brochure, that doesn't help your audience understand or have any meaning for that data. Um, so here's an infographic that shows how many active users are in the top social media networks. It right? starts with Facebook at 1.4 billion at the top, and goes to the now shut down Vine with 40 million at the bottom. All the rectangles are the same size. All the fonts are the same size. There's no visual cue here showing you what the difference between those values are. So it's really hard for you to read all those numbers and do all those comparisons on your own in your head. Um, and it makes it puts a lot of onus onto the reader, and it doesn't make their life any easier. Um, here's another one. I just got this one last week. Um, this is up from a report that is talking about security and open source software, right? And all they did was like, hey, we have all these statistics, come check out our infographic. And this is what it was, right? It was a whole bunch of big numbers, um, which really doesn't, doesn't help me at all. Um, it's tough to visualize a number all by itself, right? So you can't have a bar chart that only has one bar. Um, Three billion, great, fantastic. Is that supposed to be big or small? I don't know. Um, so if I visualize it, um, in this pie chart here, and compare it to the total population of the planet at a little over 7.2 billion, now you have some context, right? More than a third, not quite a half. We're doing okay, but we got a long way to go. And right, and as the designer, I've now created that context that I can now take that perception and move on to whatever my main point is. That second value, if you need to find a second value to compare to, is very important. Um, if I change this and do this, now this blue circle is that same 3 billion global internet users, but down here I have the total population of the US, which is only 320 million. Um, that's almost 10 times every man, woman, and child in the US. That's a lot of people on the internet, and that's a very different perception of the data in a different context. Um, and so you don't want to skew it. You want to make sure that your audience has, a, has an appropriate understanding and perception of the data and context um, so that they can understand what you're about to tell them and it helps that lead them to the same conclusions or insights that you found in the data. Um, sort of a separate side note, this happens all the time in PowerPoint presentations or um, especially infographics and other things, but if you visualize some values, like this 49% in this donut chart, and then some other values you just don't visualize, you put them in a big font or whatever, um, this stuff is considered unimportant, right? This becomes secondary data. They're gonna, their eye is attracted to the visual, so they assume if you took the time to visualize it, this is the most important thing I need to be looking at. And sometimes that's true, and sometimes they, you know, they had the data and it was easy to visualize, but here's their main point and it gets lost because the reader may or may not even consider that to be important on the page. 
So these are the big three. Bar charts, line charts, and pie charts. I don't have a statistic, but easily, far and away, most of the information, the data in the world is visualized in one of these three ways. Um, feel free to break away from these three ways. <laughs> Um, in my role as VP of Product Development, when I was doing that for consumer products, we would get consumer research reports, 200 page reports with 150 bar charts in them. And it was just mind numbing. I mean, by bar chart 12, it was mind numbing. Um, and so you gotta sort of branch out a little bit. Um, some of the tools have some other options. So PowerPoint has about uh, 25 charting options that you can choose from. This is Keynote, they have about a dozen um, in a couple different styles. This is Tableau, Tableau users in the room, a handful. Uh, Tableau has about, uh, I think it's about 26, something like that. Um, and it tries to highlight the ones that are applicable to the data set you've already selected or already moved into the, the main piece of Tableau. So all these grayed out ones you could try, but it doesn't know how to do them with the data you've already selected. Um, IBM Watson Analytics, anybody playing with Watson Analytics? A couple. Um, they try to do the same thing where they recommend a couple charts, but all these charts uh, are available. And so they've got a dozen different chart styles here. Um, so that's just, you visualize the data. Congratulations, you've done a data viz. Um, oops, but if we want to do data viz design, did it do that? There we go, data viz design. Um, feel free to branch out and use different data viz styles, especially in the same presentation, the same infographic, the same blog post or article, help your audience by breaking up that data into a couple different visual styles so that they know they're moving from one data set to the next. Um, that really helps your readers move along in the information. There are hundreds of ways to visualize data. Part of what we do is come up with new ways to visualize data all the time. Um, you don't have to use some of these really complex ones. Sometimes a bar chart is the best way to visualize the data. Um, but if you do everything that way, um, your audience truly does go numb. You want to have your own data viz toolbox. And so generally, I, I help people find the right tools for the data they're working with. Um, mapping software or websites. Uh, if you want to make the best kind of map, it's not going to be the same software that makes the best bar chart or makes the best word cloud or makes the best sand key diagram. Um, you're going to want different pieces or different tools, which might be software, which might be websites, which might be code, um, to make the kind of visual depending on what kind of data you have to work with. This is called the chart chooser diagram um, from Dr. Abela. Um, and the idea here is just to help you find what's the appropriate type of chart to work with your data. So you start in the middle. Like what kind of data do you have? So if you have comparison data, then you move up and say, okay, these are the types of charts that are applicable to comparison data. Um, click, anybody click users? Click, click view, click sense a little bit. Um, they partnered with him. If anybody wants a copy of it, you can download it it's on the links page. I thought that's where I had it. Yeah, here we go. They made a color version of this. But if you just want a quick cheat sheet, I have a handful of these printed off, but you can download the PDF um, from the link that's on that links page. Often what happens, and we're gonna talk about mistakes that people make a little bit farther, is because they've picked the wrong kind of visual style to go with the data that they're working with. Um, this is called the graphic continuum. It's a one page sheet laminated that has about 80 different data visualization styles in it. Um, and it's categorized by groups. So these are all time-based data, so trending data, distribution data, parts to whole or percentages, geospatial and mapping data. Um, and so the idea is that this is just inspirational to give you ideas um, for different ways you can visualize data. You can look at this, I think they're five bucks online to order one of these laminated sheets. Um, or you can look at them online. There's a great website called the Data Visualization Catalog. So this is a free site, it's a personal project of Severino Rebecca that has, I don't know how many, I haven't counted, um, but he keeps adding more visual styles as you scroll down on his page. And every one of these, if you click in to say this, uh, the rose diagram, in there it'll show you examples of the diagram, links to actual use of that type of data visualization in the real world, um, usually from news sites or something like that. And if he has it, links to tools that'll create that type of visualization. Um, like the um, graphic continuum, if you view it by function, you can see only like parts to whole or percentage based, and it'll only show you those types of visualizations. You can narrow it down, that kind of thing. Um, great reference. 
He's doing it on his own, so if you go down past here, some are grayed out because he just hasn't finished them yet, um, but it's a fabulous resource. Um, one of the exercises I do with my class is we try to come up with how many ways can you visualize a single percentage. Um, so we've made this cheat sheet. This is 20 ways to visualize a percentage. Um, if anybody wants a copy of this, I can send you a PDF or I have a couple printouts here. Um, I had one class that came up to 28. That's the highest that a certain class has come up with. But there are a whole bunch of ways that um, you get a whole bunch of percentages in, in your corporate world that you don't always have to make it into a pie chart. Um, you can break out and try to visualize it in a handful of different ways. Um, don't be afraid to get away from the charting button. So just because the PowerPoint chart tool doesn't make it doesn't mean you can't make it. Um, so part, uh, designing with objects is just one out of five icons to show 20%. You can color one out of five icons and make your own data visualization. Anybody familiar with uh, the Noun Project? So the Noun Project is a fabulous online resource of icons. They have over a million icons available, searchable by keyword, um, and designers all over the world are submitting more icons all the time. So the fabulous part of this is, number one, it's free to search and just give you ideas. Um, all these icons are free to use if you give the designer credit. So if it goes into something that gets published, the icon has to have, you know, icon by Randy Crumb, blah, 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 copyright, whatever. Um, I think I pay nine bucks a month for free use of any icon anytime in any works that I use. Um, so it's just a fabulous resource. Um, they have just released a plugin for PowerPoint. Um, and Word even, so that you can do a search for icon in PowerPoint, and you just drag it over, and it goes into your slide. Um, they also just released, if you use the Adobe Graphic Suite, the Creative Suite, there's a plug-in for Adobe as well, so you can have this noun project search built into Illustrator. Um, they come as PNG images or SVG vectors, um, so you can scale them as much as you want. Is it possible Say that again? You said you had a credit to them, right? Does it do the same thing already? Yeah, so when you bring it up, it'll tell you who the uh, designer is. Um, if you're not a paying member, if you're using it for free, I think it only shows you the first hundred for each search. Um, or you log in with your account, it'll just show you if it'll scroll forever. Um, the other nice thing is you can tell it what color you're working with. So if you have like your brand color, it will automatically color the icon for you before you move it over to the slide. But it doesn't go ahead and automatically put the credit to no, you have to do that yourself. Okay. These grids of 100 squares, um, there's no tool to do that. Um, this is literally 100 squares in PowerPoint. You select the right number of them and you change the fill color. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, some people call these square pie charts or waffle charts or even a matrix, something like that. Um, but I find when you have a lot of percentages on the same page, they're very useful. Um, but it's just a matter of you got to create it the first time, and then you can copy paste as often as you want. Um, things like this. So this is showing how much money in that charity is actually going to the charitable program versus how much is being shown in uh, the, the goes to their administrative cost, right? And this is just an image of a hundred dollar bill with semi-transparent rectangles put over it. I mean, that's just done in PowerPoint. Um, there's nothing really fancy about that, but you can create a visual like that that has relevance to, I'm talking about money, or I'm talking about raising money, um, and how I spend that money. Uh, Wordle.net, and I'll show you, I got a tools page, I'll show you in a minute where I've got 10 different, I think, word cloud tools, but Wordle.net is probably the most popular word cloud tool in the world. Um, you can drop in as much text data as you want. It does all the math. Um, this is Facebook's privacy policy, and uh, it does all the math to figure out word frequencies and then creates this word cloud for you, and you can change the font, you can change the colors, you can have some of the words go horizontal and vertical um, and sort of mess around with it, and then export this as a PNG file or do a screen capture of it and put it into your PowerPoint or in your report or whatever you're working with. Um, but you can drop in as much text as you want and just let it run and, and do its thing. Um, Batch Geo uses Google's mapping API to map a spreadsheet of locations. So instead of going to maps.google.com and doing 200 store locations, you can just paste your spreadsheet in. It will use Google's API. This is a Google map. Um, and it does all of this automatically off your spreadsheet. You can do 
up to 250 locations for free. Beyond that, they want you to subscribe to Batch to you. If you're doing thousands of locations, then that's how they make their money. Um, say that again. Is this downloadable or is this online? So this is online. It actually gives you a URL to share with other people. And this becomes an interactive Google map. You can zoom, you can move around. You can actually add extra data to every one of these. So in your spreadsheet, like this is a, a map of Costco locations. If you also have in that spreadsheet their phone number, their store number, the date they opened, when you click on one of these map pointers, it shows you all that extra data. Um, so it's all interactive that way. The only way to export it then is to take a screenshot of or to try to export it from the web. That was my question, Randy. How is this going to help me with uh, my reports? Have to download this or what? Yep. So you would have to you have to do an export off of here, and the easiest way is to do a screen capture. Um, or do a save as from Chrome, you know, or something like that, so it saves it as an image file. What about the copyright exception? Huh? It's going to still say Google, you know, Maps down at the bottom, you know, that kind of thing. Does it batch geo on your data though? You have uploaded your data to batch geo for whatever reason. Yeah, but they, they, they have asked. I wouldn't want to put repository data. Correct. And and that's a good warning for any of these online tools, like. So Batch Geo not only gives you a link to the a link that you can share with everybody else so they can view all this data and have an interactive page, they give you a second link so that you can go back and edit it later. Like if you want to change the data, you can change what colors this map are built on in the background or change what these pointers are. Um, so they save all that, which means they're saving all your data as well. So if this is, hey, this is our top secret <laughs> missile silo sites. <laughs> Don't use Batch Geo. Don't use Google Maps as a whole. You know. <laughs> I mean, you, you can do all this sort of thing with JavaScript. And, I mean, you know, it's a lot more than yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Anybody experimenting with Power BI? They are probably the new up and comer, probably Tableau's biggest competitor right now. Um, Microsoft's hook is that if you already pay for Office 365, you get Power BI for free. Um, and so you can link to uh, Azure backend data, you can link to your spreadsheets in Excel, and you can link to external data sources as well. You can link to Google Analytics. Um, so I have Power BI running a mini dashboard of my website, um, something like that. And so you can do all that if you already have an Office 365 subscription. Um, they're not as robust as Tableau, but they are spending a lot of money and coming up very fast. Um, and the pricing model is how they're competing. Um, click, any click users? You said a couple. Click Sense, Click View, which one? Click Sense, online or desktop? Huh? You're exploring it. I think Click View is the older product, is that right? Click Sense is the newer product? Um, same idea. Um, Click is really good about linking to backend data sources, especially completely separate backend data sources and being able to find the, the commonality to link those two together. And, and the desktop version is free, I mean, anybody can use it. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Pardon? The desktop version is free. Uh, so ClickSense on the cloud and ClickSense desktop, you can use for free. Um, I think it's when you start tapping into some of the larger SQL databases on the back end, where that's when they start to, to want you to subscribe and stuff like that. Um, they've been a sponsor before. They're going to come do some more talks in 2018 as well. Uh, MicroStrategy. A little bit far along behind, but anybody using MicroStrategy? Um, there's a, a local group here. <laughs> We're probably going to have them come give a talk in 2018 as well. Um, they've got some work to do to catch up. I'll say that. Uh, okay, if you want to get into coding your own, charts.js is a fabulous place to start. They only have six charts. Um, the JavaScript code to make these six charts is really, they do these six charts really well. Um, and you're welcome to use that code and apply it to your own data, change your own color scheme, you know, and start messing with uh, the JavaScript of charts in the background. Once you sort of evolve beyond that, a lot of people move to high charts. Um, so high charts has over 100 JavaScript charts. Um, all their code for these interactive, so it's interactive online, um, all their code is available. It is free for you to use for non-commercial purposes, but as soon as you want to do something like this on your company website, that's when they want you to, to have a corporate license so that you're using it now for commercial purposes. But if you want to experiment, learn how to do JavaScript charts, you can go check out all their code, use their code, um, and play around with it for a project or whatever. Um, ultimately, you'll get to D3. Anybody programming in D3? So a handful, this is where most web developers, if you want to create your own, they're going to D3. Um, huge library of online data visualizations, great community about sharing their code, so that if you find one of these, you can see the code behind it, and um, even notes about what worked and what didn't, and what helps. Um, so this is when you really start wanting to do some complex uh, data visualizations, mainly interactive stuff online. You gonna say something, Vish? Um, so AT and T actually built an open source project on top of D three called mm -hmm. C, dimensional charting dot JavaScript. Okay. And for every two thousand lines of D three code, you will write maybe a hundred lines of PC JS code. Oh really? So it's, it's very neat. That's it's nice. It's open source. That's fantastic. Um, in a lot of cases, this is like the back end. So like Microsoft Power BI, it's really. D3, but it's a nice GUI front end, so you don't have to figure out the code. Um, Plotly is a different one. Anybody experimenting with Plotly? So Plotly does um, some Python interactive like data visualization for web applications. They also do some D3 applications, so you can sort of do it in this interface and then get the code that created that visual. Um, that's a really growing community. They have Plotly conferences, um, so that's really... Um, for the, for the group that's actually going to code and use these interactive charts, that's actually a really nice community that's up and coming. Um, R, programming, processing separately. Anybody doing processing? Um, this is more desktop based. So you're doing your data visualizations and analysis on your own computer and then creating an export of, hey, I want to make this interactive online, or like these, I want to record a video of that visualization I created so I can share it online. Um, so like this one is showing all the flights across America um, from the morning, and you see morning, and as the sun moves across, you can see it goes across the country. Um, so this was created in processing. 
um, and then export it as a movie so you can see it. You can do real world data viz. Um, so this is a pie chart of the most popular Girl Scout cookie flavors, right? Made out of Girl Scout cookies, the appropriate Girl Scout cookies. Um, you take a photo of it and you can make that into a data visualization as well. Um, this is from BJ's. You know, we got BJ's restaurants in the area. Um, they did this visual of just chopping up um, these photos of different beer and they show you what the beer is and what food it goes with. Pretty simple, but they do that out of real world objects. Uh, animated. So you may be familiar with wind maps. So wind maps online, um, designed by Fernanda over at Google. This shows you as current data as they can get. I think it's within the last 10, 15 minutes of wind speeds, ground wind speeds across the country. Um, and you can zoom into different parts of the country. Um, and the intensity and speed of this motion actually helps you understand the data. It actually adds meaning because um, it's also based on the data. There's a lot of code behind this. Um, but infographic designers, we stole this idea and said, hey, animation's fun. Let's bring back animated GIF files. Um, and so you'll see a number of infographics now that are shared in social media as animated GIF files now. Um, this one I would say is pure eye candy. <laughs> the running cheetah doesn't help you understand the data at all. It just attracts your attention and it's kind of cool. But that's about it. Um, but actually applying this and showing these uh, wing patterns or wing um, flight patterns for birds and insects and stuff actually helps uh, add to the meaning or the understanding of the data to your audience. Um, interactive. So this is the misery map. All right, and the misery map shows you where all the flight delays are today. Um, and so you can zoom in. So like at this grand scale, Dallas is only one dot. But if you zoom in, you can see DFW and Love Field separately. Um, and it shows you a pie chart of how many flights today are delayed versus not, and then where they were going based on this uh, line weight and almost like a sand key diagram. Is that the most? It is. was that day. <laughs> I picked a really good day to, to, to take the screenshot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you also see, and sort of in the background, it's kind of flushed out here because um, you can't quite see the map here, but you see they've actually put the weather pattern. Um, so the weather map from, um, I think from the Weather Channel, they've actually added on top of this so you can see the weather pattern across the country. Um, all these and more are on my tools page. Um, I've got, I don't know, a couple hundred tools listed on there, and they're grouped in pretty big categories, like all the word cloud tools are together. I got about 20 free image sites if you want free stock royalty-free images, um, and then there are JavaScript tools and design tools and that sort of thing. Um, I'm always looking for more because more and more are popping up. If you know of a tool, send me a note. I'll add it to the list because um, we're just trying to, to build this list. Um, I need to make it more navigable because it's getting so long, but it's out there as a reference. Um, so that's data viz design. Ultimately, we've got to get to good data viz design. Um, Edward Tufte fans, a handful. Edward Tufte, we sort of call him the godfather of data visualization. Um, former professor at Yale, has written four books, does one-day seminars all around the country. Anybody been to one of his one-day seminars? Excellent. What do you think? Great. He does a really good job, very historical perspective. Um, he'll bring out some old books uh, that visualize data. With, like, he'll put it on his white gloves because these books are so old and stuff like that. Um, Fantastic resource um, and does a lot of good stuff. As a designer, we need to tap into a few things that we know about human psychology. And one is that the huge part of your brain is dedicated to just processing visual information. Um, this study says 80%. I've seen 60%. I've seen 90%. Um, and just, it's a huge part of your brain that's just about visual information. You can recognize this lion hiding in the grass and understand the meaning that your life is in danger if you were to come across this within nanoseconds. I mean, you get it. You not only understand that there's a difference between the lion and the grass, and that there's the meaning that's life-threatening. Um, we also have what's called the picture superiority effect. So the picture superiority effect is that if all I did was stand up here and talk to you, right, you'd only walk away three days from now remembering about 10% of that information. That's all you'd be able to remember if it was all audio only or text only. If you just read a book or read an article and it's all text, you're only going to retain about 10% of that information. But if we can tap into the visual part of your brain and tie our information to a visual, you're now likely to remember up to 65% of that information three days from now. Um, and so it's really powerful from a marketing perspective when you want people to make a purchase decision later, from a business perspective when they're going to make business decisions or they're working on their budget or they're working on their future strategy. You want them to remember what you've told them later, a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, whatever it is. 
Um, so good data viz, I think, contain these three characteristics. They're understood faster, right? You've made it easy for your audience to understand what you're showing them. You've made it memorable by making it visual. You've tied into that visual part of their brain. Um, and ideally, you've made it actionable, right? You've actually led them to make a better decision, to purchase a product, to vote a certain way, to eat healthy, call their mother, whatever it is you want them to do with this information that you're, or insight that you're giving them. Um, but when we talk about good data viz design, we also have to talk about bad data viz design. Um, and there's probably more bad data viz design out there than there is good data viz design, right? Complexity is not understandable quickly. Um, sometimes it helps with the understanding of the data. There is a certain level of complexity that you need to get your message across, but don't ever, <laughs> ever design a chart like this. <laughs> oh, this is just bad in so many ways. Um, starts repeating colors and it's 3D and they're at least in order, I think, but good luck trying to find main, you know, or whatever. <laughs> oh, your job as a data viz designer is to reduce the visual noise. Take out anything that doesn't actually help your audience understand what you're showing them. That could be text, that could be colors, certainly clutter because you want to make it as simple as possible. Sometimes it means pulling data out of there because um, some uh, data scientists I know like to throw, well, I want to show you all the data I had. Well, that doesn't help. You know, they, I mean, that proves you had a lot of data to work with, but that doesn't help them understand what you found. Um, when you use images, in most design, we tend towards this side from images. So if these are all representative of students, full color photos have millions of colors, that's very visually noisy. Um, that adds a lot of visual noise that doesn't actually add additional meaning. Um, we can take the background out and have like, a white background. We can have silhouettes all the way down to icons. But you see icons most often because this is a very simple representation, usually one or two colors. Um, and you get the same idea of student with very little visual complexity here. Um, if you look even at that distance and you can't read any of these infographics because they're long, um, but something with a very simple color scheme and no photos appears like, hey, I'm going to be able to understand this and read through this pretty quickly versus stuff with full color photos, especially one like this where the, they're completely different photos with completely different color schemes. is just very visually noisy going on here, even though there's not any more data or information here than there is on the other infographic. Um, a lot of brands, and you may work for some, um, photos are part of their brand identity. Right? They have to use photos. We like showing people. We want to show photos of stuff. Um, American Airlines is like that. So when you visualize data using photos, you want to make your data visualization as simple as possible. Um, because this visual, the photo, is where all the complexity is going to be. So in this case, this is all circles of all just one simple color. Um, we generally have to use a lot of these semi-transparent backgrounds um, to help you be able to read data visualizations or text on top of photos if you're really in a position where you want or have to use a photo. Um, if I didn't put those there, um, it's really hard to read um, that text on a full color photo background. And that's not going to Adobe. That's just doing a rectangle in PowerPoint or whatever, in, even in Word, um, just to give you some background so that it makes your data or your text pop a little bit easier. Um, sometimes what we'll do, so this is um, a photo, and what we'll do is if we say, I want to put this data viz on here, I have all this space, but I have light spots and I have dark spots. And so, you know, white text works here, but black text would work better here. Um, in PowerPoint, if all I do is add this semi transparent background and make it a gradient that goes, the square goes to about here, and it's fully transparent here. So you see no line, no break here, but it's just a background that darkens that part of the photo so you can put your text and your graphics on top of it. Um, default charts always come with a, a chart legend. Excel, PowerPoint, they throw this in here just in case you need it. And I would say in most cases you don't. Um, you actually make a simpler, easier to read chart if you can get rid of this color key. Um, so if I delete it and just move those titles down here into the chart, and I had fun, I went over to Noun Project and just added some icons to show these uh, age groups in the US, this is the US population in age groups. Um, now all that information and even the information about what each of these bars is, is in one field of view. You don't have to look over here to find out what green is and then look back and look over here to find out what purple is and then look back. Um, you don't go back and forth if you can get rid of that color key. 
Um, and that always helps. If there's any way you can get rid of it um, as a design, it's a better design without that color key. So here's another one. This is a, a default chart um, in Excel. And I say don't use the templates, but what I really mean by that is to don't start with, or don't end with the templates. Go ahead. Um, previous, previous slide, um, there's color here, but does color mean anything with the, with the Nope. Nope. In this case, and I hate this, Excel makes everything a color or PowerPoint, and they make a color for every you know, segment or cluster of data. Um, so I just left that alone. The only thing I did to this chart was remove the, um, the data. So this one, again, it's its default colors. It's got everything it does by default, you know, axes, grid lines, the color key legend, and everything. Um, and never leaving Excel or PowerPoint, you can do the same thing in either one. Um, you can turn this chart into this chart, right, where here, I've gotten rid of the color key, I got rid of the grid lines, I got rid of the y-axis, I simplified the x-axis to just show months, I put the data in the bars, and then instead of this color key, I put the company logos over the data set so you can see that's Lowe's and that's Home Depot, and then colored the bars to match their brand colors. So blue now has meaning, these are Lowe's store openings and the orange ones are Home Depot store openings. Um, makes it a lot more relevant to the data set. And I never had to leave Excel or PowerPoint to do it. Um, it's not like I have to go to Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator to create something like this. Um, it takes about, what is that, 10 steps? 10 steps to go from the default and then clean it up and get to um, the nicely now formatted chart that if you put this in an infographic or put this in a blog post, it looks like a nice custom chart that nobody else has designed before. Um, Apple does this really well. This was last year when they launched the iPhone 7s. Um, but they've gotten rid of all the grid lines. There's nothing on the axis over here. There's only one number on the whole chart showing you what they want you to focus on. Um, inaccuracy. You wouldn't think I'd have to tell you that inaccuracy is bad. Um, but you'll see it all the time. Once you start looking for it, you will be amazed at how many charts don't actually match the data. Right? Look, look at those numbers. I'll let you absorb that for a second. <laughs> they were really trying to push that nobody's worried about the Zika virus. Um, but the data doesn't actually show that, right? So the data should look like this um, um, and make a big difference. You really got to be paying attention. And accuracy will kill your credibility. Um, not only, you know, we said visuals are more memorable, they're that much more memorable when you miss them uh, or make mistakes as well. Um, the golden rule of pie charts, right? They have to add up to 100%. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they have to. How do you mess up a pie chart? But apparently pie charts can be tough. Um, this kind of data was a survey data where it was like check all that apply had no business in a pie chart whatsoever. Those numbers aren't ever supposed to add up to 100%. Right? You're just supposed to be showing you know, how many people selected each of the choices, whatever they were. Um, and you'll find it all the time. right? That's not what 80% looks like. That's not what 20% looks like. But people just, just blow through this stuff. right? They assume that the chart is right. And they look at the chart before they read the numbers. And that's how you can really, um, hopefully mistakenly, not purposely, um, mislead an audience. Right, so these are this is what the donuts should look like um, if they're accurate. Um, this is the Cisco Visual Networking Index. Um, I, I use this to show how much traffic is moving across the internet, but they created this infographic with all their data, um, which is fantastic. They got some unbelievably good data. I reference this data all the time, but when they created this infographic, some designer did a copy paste on the bars. Right, there's no charting program that's creating these rounded rectangle bars. They're exactly the same in every one of these. They just copy pasted the bars and then changed the text numbers. These text numbers have nothing to do with what these bars look like. <laughs> um, this is one I posted on the blog earlier this week. And I catch this stuff because I look at this stuff all day long. Right. And I can tell. So and this is much longer and there's a whole bunch of stuff here, but as you're going through this, you see this one chart. Right? And I can tell when I look at these that these bars don't match the numbers. So if you assume that, okay, we got new businesses and how many new jobs are created. We got how many business closed and how many jobs were lost. If we just pick one, and I pick this 220,000 bar. If we just pick that one bar and say, okay, that, that one's right. 
Okay, 805,000 should be that long. 717 should be that long and 205 should be really close to that 220 bar. It should be longer than that. I don't know if the designer was just eyeballing it. It's longer rectangle, it's close enough. Um, it might be a non-zero baseline over there. They might have skewed the whole chart, but I can't tell because there's no, nothing on the axis. Um, but it's misleading. Like, there's a bigger story here. They've actually created a ton more jobs and they've missed showing that in the visual. Oh, there's a whole website, not mine, um, <laughs> called WTF Visualizations at viz.wtf. You can lose a, a few hours if you want to go visit viz.wtf <laughs> and see some just horrible stuff that it's all submitted from resources from outside because people find this stuff and they just submit it to the website. Um, it's, it's just atrocious what you'll find on that site. You want to take a photo of that? Okay. Like seriously, you will lose hours just scrolling through this stuff. <laughs> um, the big guys do it too. So this is Nielsen. Everybody familiar with Nielsen doing all their market studies? Um, this is smartphone market share. This is back in 2012. Um, and this visual is called a tree map. So the entire rectangle should add up to 100%. And every one of these inner rectangles should match its portion of 100%. Um, but when you look at it, 34% for Apple and 9% for BlackBerry shouldn't be that close. I mean, they're, they're obviously not the same, but they shouldn't be, even be close. Um, they had to come back, uh, it was like two or three weeks later, and actually publish, here's the corrected version. right? Dramatically different. And I don't know if someone just changed the numbers and forgot to change the tree map or what, but it's, it's not even close to what the original design was. Um, so your credibility is defined by your data viz. You will really shoot yourself in the foot. Um, we even teach infographic resumes in the class, and I do presentations on infographic resumes. You mess up a data visualization on your resume, forget it. <laughs> um, I call these false visualizations where the data is good, the data is right, the visual doesn't match the data. Um, this was an infographic, um, I think 2015 from Vox Media. Anybody remember seeing this one before? Um, so the idea here, this is back when the ice bucket challenge was big. Remember the ice bucket challenge? So this column is, each one of these is a different charity, and the circle, the data is showing you how much money they're raising to fight deadly diseases. This chart is how many people are dying from the diseases that this column is trying to raise money to fight. Okay. Pretty simple. They were trying to show that down here, these are how many people are dying from ALS, and because of the ice bucket challenge, they were moving up and raising a disproportionate amount of money. That was the whole point, right? Data's great, circles are all wrong. Oh, I got upset, got under my skin, so I redesigned it to be correct, right? So they actually have it, it is in descending order, right? But it's nowhere near to the point where you can't even see these circles um, down here at the bottom. And then I added these lines because you know, this is breast cancer and this is Komen Walk for the Cure. And so that was the idea is that pink matches pink. Um, and you can see what the connections are. So when you do shapes, any shapes, circles are harder than others, but when you do any shapes, your audience sees the area of the shape to match your data. You're creating a two-dimensional shape for a one-dimensional number, a single number of data. So to do it correctly, like if I want to show three times the value of the first one, you have to calculate the area of this one, triple the area, and then figure out what's the diameter that makes that area to do that correctly. What everybody does is they triple the diameter, right? Because that's what the software says, right? You make a circle in PowerPoint, it says width and height. Same thing in Illustrator and every other piece of software. No software says area and what to do with it. Um, so what happens is the diameter is one inch. I want to make a circle three times larger. I make my diameter three inches. I actually make a circle that's nine times larger. Um, CNN did this. Um, so CNN had this report about ISIS attacks across the country. They had all these maps about different areas of the country. Um, and this was continually being updated every time there was a new attack. Um, and I'll blow this up over here. Right, so this is their scale. Right, here's one incident. And here's three incidents. Which is perfect. This was the example I showed in the book. It's great. And I can tell all they did was triple the diameter. <laughs> right, all this extra space your eye is seeing as extra data that's not actually there. So these look like major hot zones um, when this circle should only be about this size, right? So one and three, this is actually nine times larger. It looks like that part of the country has been blown off the map. <laughs> um, they finally fixed it after about a year and a half, um, and they're still adding to it. But they finally did correct it. Um, this is what it should look like. Um, so I did this as an example. This is the city of Bedford um, and their budget. And so this, all these circles on the left 
are sized for their sources of income and all these ones on the right. This is all where they spend their money and expenses. So this here is the police department that I blew up. So you can see an $11 million police department and all the ways that they spend their money. Um, and that's what happens. But to do that, you got to create a spreadsheet. The de designers don't like to work in spreadsheets, but you got to create a spreadsheet and actually calculate what should those diameters be to correctly create circle sizes. Um, and this is the formula. This is what you can use. Um, so you always have to have a, a master circle. Like say, this is my master circle. I've already predetermined this diameter is 0.36 inches. So if this value is four times larger, use this formula and you can calculate what is the diameter of every other circle in that same data set that's compared to that first circle because you want them all to be proportional. Um, if anybody wants it, I have a reference sheet that has that formula. Um, so you can use it for any value. And if by chance your numbers are whole multiples of each other, if it's 18 times your first value, I've already pre-calculated what that factor is. Um, but you guys are welcome to um, grab a copy of that sheet if you want it. This is what it should look like. So this is 20th century death. These are all the major causes of death within the 20th century. Um, and all these circles are sized appropriately in this giant poster. Um, and that's what it should look like. Um, it's true for bars too. So bar charts are the same thing. You don't see the height, you see the area of each of these rectangles. Um, so if we do the math, and these are both two inches wide, and this one's two inches tall, and this one's six inches tall, for rectangles, the formula for area is perfectly, right? It's directly proportional to the area, as long as you keep one of them the same. And so four square inches to 12 square inches is three times the area. You don't ever want to make a bar chart with different widths, because now the math breaks down, right? The height no longer is directly proportional to that area. I can't tell if, is this bigger than this one? It's shorter but wider, I can't tell. Different widths are bad. And you think, who would do that? Who would create a bar chart? Well, let's look at the Washington Post. <laughs> so they have this chart. All right, so this is how much alcohol Americans drink, right? And so they broke the entire population into these 10% chunks. So the bottom 10%, the second 10%, the third 10%, all the way to the top 10%, okay? The top 10% of the country drinks 74 drinks a week. How are they alive? <laughs> <laughs> but what they did is, I don't know if the editor just said, okay, you can make this chart, but you have to fit it in this square. So they did this nice, weird, you know, little icons instead of just regular bars. Um, but then when they finally got to 74, they didn't make one 74 tall. They made it one, two, four columns wide because they had to fit it into that space. Right? And you as the reader, what you see is this. Right? How does that make sense? And it really isn't that hard just to put a bar chart in there and make it right. right? That looks much more dramatic and you get the point by actually visualizing it correctly. Um, 3D, any fans of 3D charts? 3D charts are bad. 3D is bad. <laughs> um, there are very few cases where 3D actually works. Um, the problem is visually, Everything closer to you is larger. Everything farther away from you is smaller. So in this pie chart, even though 35% is a larger value, there are more blue pixels on the page than there are purple pixels. So it distorts the visual a little bit and doesn't actually match the data. Um, this bar is about, it's only one off from that value, but it's, it's like 50% more green on the page. And so it distorts uh, the user's impression of the visual, and this looks like, hey, this is really big, we're doing great, when no, you're just doing the same as you did six months ago. Um, there are a couple cases um, that are arguably good for 3D. Go ahead. When it's a line, it doesn't distort it. Okay. True, but it's harder to read when you make a line 3D, because yeah. then you get, it's hard to follow the axes, the grid lines and stuff. Um, so it's like 3D objects, like the size of the planets, Right, that makes sense to make a 3D. Anybody seen this one? This is the New York Times when the Winter Olympics were going on, visualizing the luge in Times Square. Right, so you can actually see how many city blocks it goes back and how high it goes to give you some scale and perspective. Um, this is the entire amount of water on the surface of the Earth if you made it up into a droplet over the US. So this is the entire amount of water in all the oceans on the planet lakes and rivers, right? And so because it's a volume of water, it makes sense to make it a volume in a 3D visualization. So there are a couple cases I think that's arguably, you can do it in 3D. 
Um, zero baselines I mentioned earlier. Uh, Non-zero baselines are bad. Um, so here's a chart. I don't always pick on Fox News, but they do do a handful of things bad. The chart's right. Okay, they accurately, you know, identified the y-axis and they started at 34% and went up to 42%. But it looks like, to their audience, my taxes are going to go up by six times. Right? And that's what they were trying to do. When the real chart looks like this, right? It goes up, but not by six times. Right? Or you could shrink that down into just that square. Um, it is common practice in financial markets. I think there are some other areas in data where we're adjusting the y-axis specifically to not start at zero. Makes sense. If you look at stock prices, this is a, a year of Apple's stock price. They always change the scale to maximize how much differences you can see in that line. Um, so you just have to know what you're looking at and that that's not zero baseline. So this is median household income in the US. Um, and it looks like we've had this huge drop off um, from 2007 to 2010. But if I zero baseline it, it's like, nah big deal, right? And maybe it is a big deal, right? Uh, and this actually looks like it's a huge deal. So you might, in my recommendation, start with the zero baseline chart and say, hey, you're, you're not really seeing the whole story here. Let's zoom in and take a closer look and say, hey, this is the lowest it's ever been or the lowest in the last decade or something like that. Um, so you give them that reference and that scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, scaling pictograms means changing the size of logos, icons, um, shapes like that. Um, you don't ever want to make a chart like this um, because you have, we talked about area, you've now changed two different dimensions of each of those icons to make them proportional. So your eye sees a bar chart with three different widths and it doesn't make any sense. Um, some in infographics do this. So this is an infographic, boy, that's really whitewashed. You can't see, there's a world map behind here um, that you can't see. Um, so all these, the data is right. The height of these lines matches the data very nicely, and then they went one step too far and they put this two-dimensional silhouette of a big next to each one of these. So 47% is about double 23%. That line is twice the height of 23%, but this silhouette illustration is four times larger than this one, and so it distorts how you interpret that data. Filling pictograms, you'll also see. So designer will say, okay. 75%, I'm just going to measure 75% of the height and color it to there. Um, but I don't know how to calculate the area of that. I mean, I could probably figure out some half circles and some rectangles and, and try and figure it out. Um, but there's a lot less area down here, and that's just wrong. This is probably the worst data visualization I've ever been able to come across. Um, I don't know what the colors mean. I don't know what the heights of the different colors mean. The areas of them are totally different, and they certainly don't add up to 100%. So I, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I got this email. Anybody familiar with PDMA, the Product Development Managers Association? Um, so I got this email. They do a lot of good stuff. I've spoken at that conference before. Um, and I started looking at it and go, wait a minute. You're going to show me that that's 23%. Now. That's 23 blue squares out of, what, 30? Yeah. So that's not 23%. And so they kept the same 30, and they kept color in that. I don't know if they just cut off or what, but it doesn't make any sense. And then I went over to this, right? And so they colored this icon of a light bulb innovation, new product development. Um, and they did all these heights based on the data. Um, but these two sixes, right, you can nothing here and this and this one. And then this 10% is small, and this 15% is about two, two and a half times more blue pixels than this one. It just gets to be a mess. Don't do it. Don't fill pictograms with different colors and try and make a match. Um, separately, you do need to give your audience a reason to believe your data. Um, I don't care if it's your own data, your internal data, market research data, a survey you did, or data you found online. Um, you want to be as data transparent as possible. So this is a tree map of the budget of the BBC, and they did a fantastic thing that down here, not only they list their sources, but they included a link to a Google spreadsheet that has all their data, that anybody can go look and check out their data, visualize their own, double check the numbers, whatever they want to do. They made it fully transparent. Here's the data we used. This infographic was published by the White House. This is back in 2012, so this was the Obama White House, about his energy agenda, our domestic oil production, other foreign oil sources, alternative energy, um, 
nobody has any idea where any of the numbers came from. Right? There's not even a citation of data from somewhere. Right? And so nobody knows. The, all the discussion and posts about this infographic were, are they making these numbers up? Where did they get this data? I've never seen these numbers. These numbers don't match what I have. Nobody has any idea where the numbers came from. They just assume, well, it's from the White House. You should believe us. Um, I love Wikipedia. Don't ever use Wikipedia as your data source, please. Um, unless your project is you're working for Wikipedia. Um, at the bottom of every article, you can find references to where their information came from with links. Go make sure that that original data source says what you think it does. And when you cite your data, um, cite the original source, not Wikipedia. Um, so you want to be transparent with your data. And this is what it should look like, where you've got either reports or news articles or data sets you link to so anybody can go and find that data if they want to. Um, you do want to tell a story to your audience. Um, everybody asks up front, like, who is your audience? But I think the more important question is what decision are they trying to make? Because the information you're giving them, you're trying to inform an action. That's really more important than who are they. Um, then you can decide in your data viz, what's that one thing that you want them to remember by making it visual um, so that you pit that picture superiority effect. Don't try and put 10 highlighted things in one data viz. They won't remember 10 different things. Each data viz should have one, one infographic should have one key message. Uh, a frame is tied with the time also that you're showing up. On what do you mean? Uh, the time of seconds that you're showing mm -hmm. and the kind of information you're showing. It maps with the, with the time and the design that you're doing. Yes. <coughs> yeah, so time per slide, per visual, per whatever. Yep. Um, so this one I just call a big pile of data. Um, it's an infographic about Salesforce, the company, um, and it's everything they could they could dig up about Salesforce. Um, it's so their it's their revenue, it's all their acquisitions that here, um, it's all their global locations, their app categories, all their partners. Um, it's just everything thrown in there. Now, what's what are you supposed to do with this data? I don't know. What's your action? I don't know. What's your key message? I don't know. Um, anybody seen landscape designs like this? They're becoming very popular. They're not very useful. Um, this is the social media uh, landscape where each of these categories is a different kind of site, and then they throw in all the logos of the main companies they can find that do that function. I got to go to the previous slide. Please. Yep. So obviously, somebody, some poor guy is trying to basically tell two many stories. So oh yeah. Basically, break each of these down into different names or graphics, right? Right. Or figure out what's the story. Is the message that they're gobbling all these people up? Is that the story? <laughs> right, and so focus on that. I don't care about their app categories and otherwise, but figure out what is it you, you're trying to tell your audience, not just, hey, look at all the stuff we know about Salesforce. It's almost like visual for the sake of being visual. <laughs> um, this gets even more complicated, right? So this is the marketing technology landscape. It's not very useful. <laughs> Somebody did a lot of work. I mean, I'll, I'll give them credit. They did a lot of work. They spent a lot of hours on this, but there's not much you can do with it. Um, in infographics, we generally try to tell a three-part story. Because online, we know we've only got somewhere between five and 10 seconds for someone to read an infographic. Um, there's going to be some background information, some framing information, might even be a couple charts to, to set up your readers to understand what your main message is. And then be pretty explicit or blatant about what is your call to action. Um, don't hide it. So this one's called the Tower of Beer. Um, and it starts with uh, Tom starts investing a dollar a day at the age of 25. And by the age of 70, he has now amassed this retirement fortune and he can afford this massive tower of cases of beer. Right? And visually, we compare that down here to the Statue of Liberty and to the tallest tower in the world in Dubai. Right? And his Tower of Beer goes up into the clouds. Um, and the call to action down here, it doesn't have to be a heavy sales pitch. This one is just learn more at RothIRA.com, right? If you want to learn how to invest or whatever, then we have more information. It doesn't have to be buy our products, vote for our candidate. It doesn't have to be really strong of it. You don't want it to be. So how do you tell a story if all you have is one chart? You don't have a full infographic. Um, so here's the default chart that Excel creates for um, skin cancer rates over the course of what looks like it'd be about 30, 35 years in these four different countries. So to talk about that, we're going to do a quick exercise, and we're going to talk about pre-attentive attributes. So in design, pre-attentive attributes are visual cues 
that you understand without using your higher brain functions. You literally understand these in nanoseconds. Um, you, you're drawn to the one shape that's different or the one color that's different. Position makes a huge difference of what's in proximity to other things. Um, so everybody stand up. Okay, we're gonna do an exercise. I'm gonna show you a grid of numbers on the next slide. I want you to count how many times you see the number four in this grid of numbers. Keep it to yourself, and when you actually have a total, um, sit down and keep it to yourself. Okay, good. That's about 20 seconds. Now, it's really hard for you to process text alone. Right, you're keeping a running total, you're doing pattern recognition, running to find every four, you gotta keep track of did I count that four already or not, and then you gotta keep your running total going in your head, so what'd you get? Eight. Eight. Anybody else? Any other numbers? I got nine when I counted. It's not a trick question, don't count the title. <laughs> in the grid of numbers, that was the direction you had. All right, so there are eight. Um, and as a designer, I can make that a whole lot easier on you, right? I can make them big by using size and say, okay, how many fours are there? Um, I can make them bright white and make all the other data like a semi-transparent or a gray color. So that's all the data's here, but here's what I really want you to focus on. I can make them red. That, that jumps out at you really easily. Um, I can even be really blatant and circle them and say, here they are. Uh, or I can do all of the above. I can make them red, circle them, and make everything else fade into the background. Um, so we do that in charts. We use pre-attentive attributes as a design tool to make our charts tell better stories. So I would take, and there are different ways to do this, but I would take this chart um, and turn it into a line chart like this to tell a better story. So I've done all those things we talked about earlier, which is simplify, got rid of the grid lines, got rid of the color key. I've made Australia, which is my story, bright red, right? If you go to Australia, take a lot of sunscreen because they have this huge incidence of skin cancer per 100,000 people. And then I took out all the other colors. So Excel naturally makes every data set, every series a different color. I just made them gray. They're here for reference. You really don't need to know what the difference is. You can tell by the way I've labeled them. Um, you didn't even need all the x-axis. I don't care where 1983 is or 1990 is. I just need to know what the total date range is. Um, and so this tells a better story because it visually draws your attention to the data set I want you to look at. Germany and I did. I pulled the data set out. Um, it was a, it was another data set that kind of went like this, but it was down here and I thought it was redundant. Question. Since the data was not available for Australia until the 80s, why don't you start with the 80s? You could. Question. You could. I mean, just anybody else would design this differently. That was just my exercise of how would I improve this. If you cut this off to whatever it is, say it's 1980, you could start tomorrow there and it wouldn't be any different. You'd get the same message. Just, yeah. The story is Australia. I'm just thinking, since that's yep. the story to tell. Yep. Um, titles matter, right? So I changed the title too. Um, it's not just here's what the data is. Here's what the title used to be because it really is an explanation of of this y-axis data. And I put up in the title, here's what I want you to, to take from this chart. I want you to take away that Australia is a really dangerous place to be out in the sun. Um, again, this took about ten steps. Did it all in Excel without leaving Excel um, to create that chart. Um, here's New York Times did something similar when Supreme Court Justice Scalia passed away. Um, they plotted of all the decisions the Supreme Court made where he fell during his time as a Supreme Court Justice, made it bright red. They put all the other data here in a thinner line and in about 50% transparent. So it's there for reference. You can see all the other justices, but he's obviously the main story. Um, it is important to, just, to understand that there are two goals of data visualization, and you will probably have to do both of them. One is what I call discovery, which is you have data, and you're trying to figure something out. Um, you're doing your analysis, and you're going to visualize it in probably a handful of different ways to try to determine what's going on. Is there a cluster? Is there a trend? Is there an outlier? What are the insights I can find from this data? Secondly, you're then going to have to turn around and say, okay, I found something. I'm going to have to communicate this to a different audience probably a non-data professional audience. It might be customers, it might be you're gonna publish this to the public, 
It might be your boss or the executives of your company, um, but you're gonna have to be able to tell a clear story. And a lot of the stuff we talked about today is really focused on the communication side. Um, the best example I have found of this is Where's Waldo? <laughs> okay, everybody familiar with Where's Waldo? So Waldo's in here somewhere, right? He's our insight in the data. There's this massive amount of data points and you see blue and you start to see color clusters and you've got some analysis to do. Um, but once you find him, you need to go to, let's say your executive, right, and say, okay, here's what we found in the data and here's what we wanna do. And so if I now wanna take that from discovery into communication, if I say, look, I've grayed out all the data, I'll still show you this is how much data we were working with, um, if you think that's part of your credibility or helps your story, but highlight, here's Waldo, right? Here's where I wanna focus, here's where I want our meeting to talk about, what are we gonna do now that we found our insight? Um, simply in a pie chart, don't take all the default colors Talk about here's the pie slice, here's what we wanna do, we wanna focus on this target audience, here's how the rest of them laid out, we can talk about them some other time, but here's where I want you to focus. Um, if you do market research, so this is a segmentation study uh, of consumers, and so these five segments of consumers all have a score on these five uh, attribute scales. Um, and so it's kinda tough to figure out, okay, I'm following segment two and I'm jumping around and I gotta figure out which color is which, um, but if you did something simple, which is just color the ones that I want to communicate to you. And in this case, I did the call out. So I highlighted in price prestige, segment five is significantly higher than all the other segments. There's a huge insight here that the company can use and actually go after that kind of consumer. Um, a lot of cluster scatter plots. Um, you can show all the data. Again, I would gray out all the other data and just highlight what you want to talk about. This is way up here in the top right corner. This is the attributes more important than anything else on the page. We do have all that other data, but let's talk about what we do about this. Um, these are called, uh, I call these gap charts. Um, I've seen some people call these connected dot diagrams or something like this, where it's showing two values and comparing them. So in this case, all these 10 attributes in a survey for a city, the blue, is how they're doing. Like what's the quality of each of these attributes, traffic or bike walking or enforcing traffic laws, and the red are how important are they to the population. Um, and so there's a lot of information here, but there's a big story, which is this bar right here, right? So managing traffic congestion is hugely important up here at 98%, and it sucks, right? It has the biggest gap between how important it is and how good it is. And so that's really a story there that we use as an insight Yes, we looked at all that data, and maybe the next slide looks at one of these other ones, but that's a huge insight, and we want to talk about these one at a time and highlight them. And so that's using pre-attentive attributes. Um, there's also the reveal. So people want to know what comes next. And so when you're communicating, you can tap into that a little bit. Even if it's a still image, you want to know what's in the chest. right? You want to know what he found. right? You want to know what comes next in the story. Um, anybody seen, this is the, the video, Inconvenient Truth from Al Gore. A couple people have seen this, so these are CO2 levels in the atmosphere for millennia, millions of years, um, and he does this huge reveal during his video that he's gotten up to, here's where we are today, um, and then asks the audience where we think the, all the predictions are going, and then he gets on this big scissor lifts, right, and the screen that he's projecting on only goes up to here, so we had an extra screen show up so that he could have his chart go up as high as the data predictions were, right? And so he made this big deal out of this reveal, um, and it really draws your audience in when they do that. If you're gonna do that in a chart, step your audience through your chart. Don't, don't show them everything all at once. Um, so if you say, look, here's our prior sales for uh, five years from 2004 to 2008. That's when we launched our sales system test. Um, we kept most of our salesmen on the same system going forward, and so here's our control baseline. Um, but the group of salesmen that started using the new system were up here for the next three years, and so now we're here recommending we move all these salespeople up to the new system because we've demonstrated its success. So you've walked them through a story. They want to know what the results are as you go through that. So that's data viz. We talked about, you know, you just visualize the data. Data viz design are all the tools and that you need your own data viz toolbox because there are different tools that do different things really well. And then good data viz is actually telling a story with your data using pre-attentive attributes, using the picture superiority effect and actually telling a good story. Um, anybody, you're, you're all welcome to download a free chapter of the book. Um, it's on coolinfographics.com slash book. The first uh, chapter is online as a PDF. Um, but I've got a couple books that I'm gonna give away. Did everybody get a chance to throw 
a business card in the basket? Anybody want to throw one in still? There's some sheets up here if you want to write your name and email address on it. Yep, write one there. Randy, what, are you, what is your infographic showing on your book cover? Um, the, we had to, what I call sanitize a graphic. It's so it's colorful. Um, so these are months and these were um, hours on website uh, traffic, but we had to basically make up the data for the cover. So we just sort of made it colorful and then redid the data. So that doesn't actually reveal what's going on. Hours on website. Okay. Close to the famous one on information that's beautiful of the cultural color. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And Daryl, would you come draw? So I've got two. We'll do the, we'll do this one first. And I was only gonna do one. Who we got? Blank. Blank. <laughs> Try another one. <laughs> Somebody grab two, I'll bet, and throw it on the top one. Ying Lu. Ying, excellent. Here you go. Thank you. Um, I had this one. It's in great shape, except this corner got mangled in the mail, so I was going to give this one away as well. The only thing is there's just a dent in the top corner. This is Sudha. Oh. Uh, Sudi. Sudi. Yes. Yep. Okay, just pass that back to him. Don't make him walk around there. Sudi. Oh. Excellent. Okay. Um, like I said, for everybody else, you can download a chapter. Um, I've got another copy here if you just want to browse through it or take a look at any of these. Um, a lot of it's on infographics, so you take data viz and you move up to telling the longer infographic story and how to publish those online. Um, so that's really what um, that book is focused on. I have a Facebook group um, and an email list where I post any news going on in the data viz community, new chart styles that are now in Tableau or a new version of Click or a conference coming up and we have a discount code for a data viz conference, that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing I post on the Facebook page and through our email list. Um, and you can contact me through email. Twitter is usually the most popular place to, to ask questions and have conversations, um, but you can email me anytime. Um, any questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, the first slide. So all the links, where did I put it, are here, including all these slides. So there's a link to SlideShare, so you can see all these slides on SlideShare as well. Any other questions, thoughts? Disagree with me? <laughs> yep. I'm going to ask the question, as I elaborate the question. Okay. But, um, I'm trying to understand the, the, the reference or the relationship between your ability to come up with the data and your ability to present the data in the best possible way. So I don't know which one would have a longer learning curve. <laughs> what can you combine both together so that you can do the best you can? It's, I would say it's rare to have somebody who's fantastic at gathering the data and at visualizing the data also. Um, in a lot of cases, clients will come to me and they already have the data, they provide me with the data. Um, there are a lot of teams where in a corporation they've hired um, designers to work with data scientists and data analysts so that they work together. But in most cases, um, companies expect you to be able to display and present your own data and don't give you any tools or training in how to do so. Um, and so that's when a lot of these fall flat, where you get a report with 100 bar charts because they just kept hitting the chart button and they don't want to spend time you know, working on charts. They're writing this big, long report. It's it's a challenge. But the one thing is like, you know, pretty much in the field of data science, your data science and big data, you come up with all this data. And more and more <coughs> you know, your challenge is to like how to express it. Like for example, it was a big reveal for me. I'm always at the discovery phase, right? But it was a big reveal for me when I saw like when I wanted to display some insight, I only see that one line. But the thing is everybody else sees all the other five lines. Right. So right. If you take the discovery chart, 
yeah. and try to use that as your communication chart, it's just a mess. And, and, and until I saw that, it didn't in my head. So, you know, from a data science perspective, that's where like all the data gathering and <coughs> analysis and discovery happens, and you do get into it inside, but this is the connecting dot to the rest of the world of like how to tell a story that sticks. Right? And it's almost like, you know, a data analyst putting their spreadsheet up on the projector, right, and expecting you to see what they see. Right, they're so deep in the data. They know the data. They, they can see the outliers pretty quickly because they've spent so many hours with that data, but their audience is seeing it for the first time. Right, and they're like, what? Let me get my glasses. What? <laughs> and so you try to tell them a better story. Um, Tableau is a good tool for you guys who use Tableau. Have you used it as a presentation tool before? Um, Tableau is really trying to do the storyboard kind of thing where not only can you present data with it and have highlights and, and stuff like that, but it's all live. So if someone asks you a question live in a meeting, you can dig in and change what's being displayed because those are live charts that you can change versus a static chart in a PowerPoint presentation or something. Watson Analytics and Cognos. Watson Analytics does the same thing. Yep, they've got a, a presentation portion. Yes, and Cognos Analytics. Oh, does it? I haven't seen that one. Yep. So when you when you're referring the bad visualization examples, you mentioned that the circles and the diameter there are like problems with the frequently. Yeah. So for example, these tools of Tableau or the Power BI or maybe IBM, which one do do these products actually you know They do it right. Mm -hmm. The problem with doing bubbles or a bubble cluster in the tool is that you no longer have control as to where you want those bubbles to be. So like, the, you know, I was able to make that nice budget map because I just drag in circles all over the place where I wanted them and put them on arcs, you know, around the individual circles. Um, I think IBM, the Watson Analytics tool and Tableau, they'll create a bubble cluster, right? Well, they'll size all the, the circles correctly, but it just sort of puts the biggest one in the middle and, and puts them farther and farther out as they get smaller. Um, Excel has a bubble chart. So you have your um, x-axis, your y-axis, and then the size of the bubble, right? And so it's precisely putting them in this x-y grid coordinates. You can't grab them and move them around, and that's when you really want to take the time to create your own circles and size them appropriately so that you actually have control of how you want to display those circles. I think that's where you kind of get more of the static versus the dynamic where you get the recurring, refreshing data. That's where you take it. Exactly. Yeah, so if you look at the, the Bedford tool, um, right, so this is, this is never going to be live data, right? You're not going to see this and see all the circle sizes change when you change statistics. This is a very static snapshot of that year's budget, and that's it, um, because I've manually created these locations and located them in, around the, the information versus if you want a dashboard that's going to create this bubble map and it's going to have to adjust every time the data adjusts, then yeah, you've got to use the, the tool and you lose the control to make it a little more readable. Because at my current Ambler, I use one of those like the bubble charts, the SSRS, mm -hmm. but I was just like, I, when you showed me that this circle, like, you know, that's a bad visualization, I'm just like, what was my, you know, was it correct or not? I'm going to check, but probably it was It was, if you use the tool to create the circles, it's probably correct. I haven't found a tool that does it incorrectly. Right, no. I have a well, I, not that make incorrect visualizations. Yeah. There are plenty of tools that make bad visualizations <laughs> that, <laughs> that are hard to read. So when you're, especially for the creator of the visualizations, right? I mean, you're spending so much time on this doing this that you almost feel like, hey, this is obvious. But for somebody else who only has about four to five seconds of attention span, yep. it's not obvious. What are the kind of questions that guide you in terms of like, no, it's not obvious. Like, you know, that you have to. You know, is there a filter you go through? That like, if it doesn't go through the filter, you don't. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not the same for every story you're trying to sell. Um, we have an infographic, an infographic creative brief where we, we ask the client all these questions about what is your key message, what decision is your audience trying to make, you know, what can you assume they already know. Right, so if you're presenting to executives every quarter, they have some background, right? You're not starting them from scratch every time you present to them, so you have at least some background that you can assume they already know who their top clients are, or what the sales were last quarter, or something like that. Versus to the public, 
this is the first time they've ever seen it. You got to start them at scratch and give them some background information before you um, launch that to them. Um, we also do uh, a third party check. So once we have a first draft of our final design, we've gone through ideation and concepts, so we've actually got to a complete first draft. We find somebody who has not been part of the process at all, have them look at it and give us some feedback and see are they getting the key message we're trying to communicate. Um, it could be an employee at their company, it could be another designer. Sometimes it's, you know, my client's wife, you know, it's just it's somebody on the outside that's gonna be expected to understand this and what are they getting out of it at this point in the design so that we can tweak it. Yeah, in the uh, Salesforce example that you gave, uh, part of bad design, right? Uh, I was thinking if you overlay the cognitive load theory, that you, in your working memory you can handle four things at once. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it like six, a little six. higher. Okay, yeah. So um, I was thinking, though it looks like a lot of content, they have kind of section them. And for someone who is trying to explore, I, I like, I don't like reading text as much. Mm -hmm. I prefer uh, something like that. I was thinking for, for exploration, it, it lets me first, yeah. So I, I could focus on this graph at the bottom and then go into the detail. Uh, that's one element. Uh, and I think there are six elements on this. Yep. So I, mean, I was just thinking, I might like it, you know, if I saw it. There are some designs and I call them data dense, and this would probably fall into a data dense design, where the intent is not the five seconds. You're breaking that five seconds. It's a reference. I might come here looking for sales. You might come here looking for acquisition. Somebody else might come here for app categories, where it's just meant to be like everything we know, and people can come and look at it anytime they want to. But there's no one key story. Um, from a marketing sense, you're not gonna drive a lot of traffic with that because you're not communicating one story, you're just sort of blasting all these stories out at once, and you hit a lot of little small pockets. Um, but yeah, you can do a non five second design that's meant to be a reference. Well, that's just a good looking text. Yep. I mean, there are huge infographics about, you know, here are the 200 things that are in Google's algorithm, right? There's not one story, it's just this huge reference, and then the story is how long it is. Um, but you know, that you could go in through and you might be interested in social signals and somebody else might be interested in page rank and traffic and stuff like that. May I, may I ask what was the context? What, what, how was it presented on this one? Do you know? Like, there's part of the decision is that where it was being presented and how big the scale or this human face? Like no, it was, it was from these guys. Even though this, like, it almost looks like it's from Salesforce because it's their color scheme and got their logo and stuff. It actually was designed by these guys. Um, who are a third party supporter for clients that use Salesforce. And so they were trying to demonstrate here's how much we know about Salesforce. All right. So, probably, um, so it was in one of their blog posts about, you know, Salesforce is one of our major clients. Then no. <laughs> no way I can defend that. <laughs> yeah. I cannot defend the cloud. Can you, can you recommend a good tool for designing sanctuary charts? Um, good tool for sand key charts. I no. Yeah. <laughs> They're all very difficult. Um, I don't know about IBM's tools. I know Tableau can do it, but it's tough. Like, you've got to watch a couple videos about how to make the sand key diagram work. Um, D3 is actually the, probably the easiest way to make a good sand key diagram, is to code it. Mm -hmm. And then you can just edit the data, and you've got the template built. Yep. Um, I would suggest, um, and I haven't looked, look on the data visualization catalog um, on Severino's site and go into the sand key diagrams and see what links he has there for tools to build sand key diagrams. Okay. Data Data Aster is one of the platforms you can use for sand key. Say that again. Data Data Aster. Okay. That's one where you can use the end path function to oh, okay. generate an yep. sand key diagram over there. Data Data, data, data Aster. You can get the sand key, they get the horizontal ones, you get the vertical ones, you have the like, dual <coughs> sand keys, you have kind of unlimited things you can get into. Yep. Yeah, because sand keys are a many-to-many -many relationship. You can even get into chord diagrams, which are the circular ones where they 
connect with different line weights and stuff like that. Are you working on any new books? Right? Not currently, no. Um, I'll tell you what I am working on. I'm working on a video training site. I haven't publicly announced that because there's a, there's a placeholder page, but soon there will be a, a website where I have videos about how to do all this. Do you have something like Linux Academy where people actually can go to the cloud and generate these things? You probably partner with either IBM or mm -hmm. like, like, It'd be extremely powerful. For yeah, I, I personally have stayed away from trying to publish any tools myself. That's a whole lot of work. I mean, one of the biggest challenges as a company that we face is like the number of tools that are out there, and it's not possible for any single company to nope. catch up. So, one of the things that I look for when I, you know, when I'm introducing a new tool to, you know, whether it's my group in the past or whether, whether our company is how fast can I ramp up? <laughs> okay. And the, when I ramped up on AWS, for example, on Linux Academy, mm -hmm. it was one week. Within one week, I could basically put whatever I did in the new, whatever, on a new platform. And that was yep. beyond amazing. And it's only possible today because Linux Academy par partnered with AWS. So with your seven-minute video, at a click of a button, they can spawn off like a whole cluster, and I can play around with it. Yep. So I don't have to spend like... Do they have a sandbox environment you could play into? Completely. On, yeah. On the cloud, right? And that, that, that's what the, pl the cloud enables. Yep. And if you have like you know partner with Tableau or something like that, and then or these guys, <laughs> or whoever, right? I mean, that's, that's willing to support you on that. But that'd be like super, super, super powerful yep. for people. That's to that's nice for part task budget kind of stuff. But I, there's really a foundational need out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm I'm excited you're going to do that. I'd like to see your course up on the great courses actually. I don't know what their business model is. I don't either. One thing at a time. Yeah. Asked about Sankey. I found there's you can do a custom rain chart for Sankey. Oh, really? Some scripts out in there. in Cognos, in Cognos yeah. Analytics. Okay. No, see, I'm seeing reference for D3 and SDK kit that I'm trying to find connections to. So Is there? Let's put Daryl on the spot. Is there a, a free trial of Cognos Analytics or a free version? Yeah, there's a free trial on uh, the web based trial. Okay. So you can log into it. Yeah. There you go. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.